including the novels The Thousand Faces of Night, The Ghost of Vasu Master, When Dreams Travel, In Times of Siege, and what we are discussing today, I Have Become the Tide. And she will be in conversation with Shupriya Chaudhary. Shupriyadi is Professor of English Emerita at Jadavpur University. She's also, uh, she works on Renaissance literature and culture, translation, cultural history, and modernism, and has published widely in these fields. So welcome to Shupriyadi and Geeta, whom we've always hoped to have at this festival. So it's wonderful to showcase this book. Thank you, Geeta, for making it. Over to the two of you. Uh, thank you, Mala, and thank you, Geeta, for being here. It's just such a pleasure uh, to be back at uh, the Kolkata Literary Meet and to be in conversation with you. I've really looked forward to this kind of session for so long, and more longer than I can say, and I'm delighted, really, uh, to be here and to be able to speak with you on a book that I read with enormous interest and um, you know, absorption. I was truly absorbed by it. Um, I'd like to ask you, perhaps, to set out for all of us, not everybody will have read the book, uh, something about the background of the book, its context, its structure, because it has a very interesting structure. There are two stories, two strands of narrative running um, through it, uh, separated by almost nine centuries. And, um, but the two strands actually are, in a sense, about the same problem. Uh, they present the same kind of social um, inequality and injustice. And uh, the reason why Gita has tried to bring these two narratives together also has, in my understanding, a deeply political core to it. I mean, it, there is a kind of politics to the novel, which is really important. So, uh, Gita, if you'd like to say a little bit more about that structure and about the background of the writing, and then perhaps we can go on from there. Yes, actually, um, the book, in a way, seems written yesterday for today, um, because though it speaks about the terrible, terrible injustice of caste division, uh, both centuries ago as well as today, that the more things change, the more they remain the same in a sort of a rather horrible way. But what holds it all together, the novel, is dissent. And the specifics really don't matter. You know, there are stories that all of us can tell uh, about specific instances of dissent. What really matters is that there is a new and fresh narrative of dissent that we are seeing unfolding about us. So in that sense, this book is actually about the India, the world that is unfolding around us. So like um, all novelists who start off with living more in the imaginary world and then gradually learning how to deal with writing about the real world, mm -hmm. which was my own personal journey as a writer, I took inspiration from, inspiration perhaps might be the wrong word because inspiration sounds positive, I have real life stories, whether it's Rohit Vemula, whether it's M.M. M. Kalburgi, uh, whether it's the 12th century uh, Vachana movement uh, uh, somewhere in, Karna you know, in the regions of Karnataka. They, so the book is not about these, but they're there as sort of ancestors hanging on the walls behind. And so I had to um, structure it so that to understand why we are the way we are today, so deeply divided, 
we have to go to the past. Again, to understand how we are capable of bringing such diverse voices together and asking sharp, relevant questions from the streets of this country today. Again, we go to the past and understand that there is a history of resistance as well. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you a little more about this uh, connection uh, because uh, it's a very layered novel, uh, despite the fact that, in a sense, um, you know, it's wonderful to read. It's so, it draws you in and you are so absorbed in both the narratives uh, that sometimes uh, you might think that there are just these two narratives. That's not the case. In fact, that 900 years of history is also in some sense layered or sedimented into the book, despite the fact that actually in terms of plot line, there is the story of a character called Kannadeva or his father actually, Chikki or Chikka, Chikkaya. Uh, his story, he is a Dalit, um, who discovers almost by chance, uh, he is in fact discovered and taken to a utopian kind of uh, commune called Anandagrama. And he lives there with his friends who come from all castes and communities and inhabit this kind of wonderful utopian space. Um, and uh, his son, is, we presume, a kind of equivalent to uh, the saint uh, Basavanna. Uh, perhaps, you know, it's not really very clear, but a possible, a possible parallel is there. But he is a poet. He's a poet who comes to be known later. And there is this other story, which is set in the present, where there are three young uh, Dalit students pursuing their studies, and there is a university professor researching into the life of this uh, medieval uh, saint and discovering that, it, that his voice is not one voice, but many voices. That's really the main point of the story, that it's not just one voice, but many voices. Would you like to say a little bit more about this sense of collectivity, which I thought was one of the most important points that you're making in the novel. You know, I have um, always been fascinated by the story being heard uh, uh, by several people, but also being told by several people. So in my earlier works as well, uh, where, for example, in my first novel, I'm writing about women, but it's the uh, same familiar stories that we grow up with but that you hear various versions of. And uh, both the storyteller and the person who uh, listens to the story are changed forever yes. by the story. But here, uh, you know, after a lifetime of all of us being relatively privileged readers and writers, you start asking your, yourself the question as you get older, what is this business of poetry all about? And I, again, I think this is a very relevant question to ask ourselves now, because suddenly you're finding a certain kind of poetry being recited on the streets. You know, which your poetry professor in the university may not give full marks to. But the point is, who cares? It's serving as poetry. So in a way, asking, and this is a very important these are important questions to ask. What is culture? What are the arts? What is poetry? What is music? When you have a diverse society. So uh, I know that Krishna spoke earlier this afternoon, and you know we've had long conversations about this, that to create a kind of quote-unquote classical, uh, quote-unquote traditional uh, uh, you know, format of culture, what happens is you exclude people. And this is nothing new. You know, the Sam Kagas Nahi Dikayenge is not new. It's an old tradition. So in the 12th century, well, you know, bhakti movements uh, uh, have been very much part of this part of India as well. So where there were questions were asked of the orthodoxy, 
by insisting on a direct personal relationship uh, with the divine, which was linked with day-to-day -day work, you know? So all this, all the great mysteries of life, all the great spiritual mysteries included, were defined in terms of people's lives. So which naturally then disrupted hierarchies of caste, gender, because suddenly you all these experiments said, which didn't last for too long, they were all doomed to fail. But we know in contemporary times that the actions that fail are as important as the actions that might succeed. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, uh, about this, um, you know, it does seem that p your novel is ultimately a hopeful one. I don't want to give away the ending, uh, but it is uh, true that, uh, as you say, these actions are doomed to fail. In the present stage or structure of our society, these actions which are uh, struggling towards equality, towards gender justice, towards uh, a classless or casteless society, appear to uh, be frustrated at every turn. And yet at the same time, your novel is not without hope. Your novel does suggest that something is in the air and something with the stirring of so many people and the stirring and the uh, articulation of so many voices, something, uh, you know, the air is full of hope. And that, uh, that, that sense is there in the past as well as in the present. It's something that seems to come back again uh, cyclically as uh, generations pass and die and we, you know, we harden and ossify in a particular social structure and then we want to break it open again. So at this time in the country today, surely we are seeing a kind of mass movement, a kind of uh, signs of hope, and yet at the same time we know that very likely these will fail. That doesn't, doesn't, that doesn't take our hope away. It will, you know, we don't know. Um, uh, the happy thing about being a novelist, um, and we're so grateful for uh, our academic friends, but the great uh, freedom of uh, not having a, a, a salary and being a novelist <laughs> is that um, not only can you hope because you don't, it's not that you're stupid about it and that you see, well, these things have happened in the past, but you also realize that despite regression and then you move a couple of steps forward, that newer and newer constituencies speak up. I think that is what we are seeing today. And I want to say that, uh, uh, you know, we fiction writers are blessed that we imagine a certain world, but nothing can beat the power of reality. And that is what we are seeing today that, um, you know, whether it is on matters of caste or community or men and women, that the kind of voices we are hearing um, you know, I, I, I think uh, they, they beat all of us novelists hollow. And it's, it's a great honor to be on the same, to be singing the same tune with what is actually happening around us. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I completely agree with that. I, I was also wondering whether, uh, you know, in your the last novel before this one, In Times of Siege, is that correct? I think the sequence? Uh, yes. No. In times of siege is a little bit earlier, yeah. But in that novel, uh, you have a similar sort of character. Not quite. I mean, uh, your character in this book is in, is more charming, as it were. You know, more attractive in some uh, ways. But there's a similar sort of university professor uh, who is researching on a medieval uh, saint poet and uh, has fa uh, faces uh, criticism from the Hindu fundamentalist groups who would like to claim. Uh, this figure for their own and would like to, in a sense, Brahminize this figure and not allow uh, him to be, um, uh, to be situated in the subaltern context from which he originally came. 
And you have a similar kind of story in this novel. Mm -hmm. And we think, obviously, of M.M. M. Kalburgi because he was uh, assassinated uh, and he uh, did research of this kind. So there is a con uh, connection with an earlier novel. There is a figure here uh, situated in a similar kind of context. And there is also real life, Gauri Lankesh, M.M. M. Kalburgi, and uh, history itself. And uh, also, so I, yeah. you know, uh, I want to say that I'm, I'm really interested in what we can do. A lot of young people yes. will ask, what, what can we do? So when we are creating the hero or heroine figure, the protagonist in your fictions, um, we are not, there are those larger than life figures who are very attractive, mm. who are charismatic and who are essential maybe to a movement being taken to the next level. Yes. But what can all of us, you know, do in our own modest lives with our own little uh, limitations and our little fears and our little hungers, you know, and our own little families and their requirements and, you know, how do we live? What do we do? And I think, in a way, these you're singling out the so-called bridge characters, I think mm. of them as, the yes. middle-class characters, yes, yes, people yes. like us. Yes. Uh, but of course, we are always more interested in people who are not like us. Exactly. Because that's what, right. what we want yes. to learn about. But what do people like us do? What does this word dissent mean? It seems to me that you do your job what you yes. can, whether it's teaching, whether it's being a student, um, you know, uh, whether it's being a bureaucrat pushing files. So if you can resist in all those modest ways, um, you know, yesterday in a gender panel, somebody, mm. a young man asked me from the audience, mm. uh, what can we do to change the way little boys as they're growing up think of girls, young mm. men think of women? Yes. Uh, so I said, in your own little world, you know, I, as a young woman, I used to be in a publishing house. And so we looked at textbooks. And if there was something which implied that uh, girls are inferior, we would change it. Mm -hmm. uh, we would quarrel with the authors. You know, so these are not great heroic acts. Yet, you know, we know that today when alleged yogis, you know, scorn women who are sitting there in the cold because they have made the great intellectual leap and seen the link between the CAA and the NPR and the NRC. Mm -hmm. Nobody needs to explain <laughs> it to them, you know? So I think that is something we can, you know, where uh, are the aspirations, the dreams, the hopes of fiction meets real life. Um, I'd like to ask just one question. Uh, in this novel, uh, not necessarily in your earlier ones, but in this novel, there is really uh, no very prominent woman character except for Asha. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, there, there are characters in the past. There is the wife of uh, Chikki, Chikka or Chikkaya Mahad, uh, Mahadevi. Uh, Ma that's her name, yes. yes. And uh, there are, and she is ultimately the first copyist of the poems. So th she does have an important role. But on the whole, uh, one might say that this novel doesn't see uh, women in history in the same way as some of your earlier work has done. Mm -hmm. And is there a reason for that, would you say? No, I think, you know, I think it's best we can do all this sort of, of, of course you yes. know that we all do this analysis of our work only after it's written. Yes. And um, I, I sort of call it the well-constructed lie, my replies <laughs> to this kind of question. Um, you just do what is natural exactly. to the story. Yes. And you are talking about dissent. And I personally think yes. there are women there. They're embedded as they are in yes. real life. Yes. Uh, it's also how we perceive who is on stage. Who do we look at here? Do we only look at who's sitting here, or we also look at people who are sitting there? It's it's also where we look. Um, so there are sort of uh, there are they happen to be wives or mothers or grandmothers. Maybe we have to start getting used to taking a second look at those grandmothers who just served you 
a meal and then went back to the kitchen, but you don't forget them because they're no longer visible, yes. you know? Yes. So otherwise it becomes really artificial yes. and it, it might be politically correct, but it would be a very bad novel, I suspect, <laughs> if I did that. Yes. Uh, so I'd like, uh, you know, we don't have a great deal more time for this discussion because uh, Gita would like to read from the novel. And I think that's a real privilege uh, to have the novel, uh, you know, not just the views of the author, but also the novel to reach you uh, as, it, as it is. And so uh, we'll just have a little bit more about the novel's um, background because uh, you wrote it, um, I think, early, finished it early last year, early 2019. Would that be more or less correct? And then uh, I think uh, you went right into other kinds of writing, activist writing, other kinds of work. Is that correct also? Because I'm not sure, have you started other uh, another novel after that? Good God, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wish it worked like mm. that. But uh, no, this was a little bit of writerly hubris. Yes. Um, the powers that be may not know that uh, uh, some of us writers take this very seriously when I say that this is how we dissent. Yes. Um, this is my citizen statement. Yes, yes. Um, so, yes, I uh, finished the novel end of 2018, and I was quite prepared to give it to any publisher who would publish it before the elections. Yes. More fool I. And um, uh, then we also, many of us who run something called the Indian um, uh, Cultural Forum, which mm. is a forum of everybody except those who think um, beating up each other is an argument mm. and who think the rishis did cutting edge science. Yes. So the forum decided that let's also bring together a citizen's reader called Battling for India. Yes, yes. So that that's, that's also came out to. just before exactly. the elections. Yeah. So, well, after the elections, we seem to be just going from place to place, uh, holding hands, human chain, yes. reading, talking. Right, right. No that writing That was exactly yet. what I was referring to. I was trying to remember what it was, but I knew that you had been involved in preparing this citizen's reader. I'd like, uh, you know, uh, before Gita starts the reading, I'd like to emphasize what struck me about the book so um, in, in such a moving way, that it is an extraordinarily poetic work. Uh, you know, it is full of poetry. And this poetry is, in fact, written by Gita herself because it's, uh, you know, while it, it purports to be the poetry of the past, the songs of the past, in these many voices. So they are not, uh, the, the poems are not written by just the same person. They come from all, uh, from different members of that community uh, over the stretch of past time. But the novel is, I think, you know, it could easily claim to be Gita's most poetic work so far, not just in the quality of the narration, but also because of the way in which poetry is embedded in its very texture. And there is quotation too. She uses poetry, you know, you cite two poems that you actually use from other places. But it's, uh, it, as a whole, uh, both in the present and the past, it is an extraordinarily poetic work. And I think that some of the credit for that is not just, it, does, it doesn't go just to these sant poets of the past, but also to Rohit Femula. Let's remember him. Because, you know, I think that he, as, uh, you know, uh, as a character from our own history, from our own recent history, is a student who was also a poet, who wanted to be a writer and a poet, a creative, imaginative writer. And this kind of figure is, uh, I think, at the core of what you're writing about. Absolutely. Yes. And, and uh, the book, um, uh, when I have multiple characters and multiple stories, there are really three stories in this uh, novel, I always want to have uh, a forward-looking, a future-looking uh, narrative uh, with young people, because that's why we have hope, <coughs> because there are young people among us. Uh, who are willing to teach um, the older people if only we are willing to listen. <laughs> Would you like to start your reading now? Yes. Yeah, sure. I always feel that if you stand, you work. 
a car door. <laughs> I hope you can hear me at the back. I'm often told that my voice is so loud that I don't need a mic, but <clears throat> I want to actually read four short extracts looking at if you like, the situation, the unchanging situation of injustice and inequality. One from the past and what people do about it, because people always do something about it. And the same thing in the present. So if we go back, say, about a thousand years, 900 years, and there's a boy called Chikka, whose father has just been buried. And Chikka has run away with some strangers who claim, horror of horrors, that all men are equal, all men are brothers. And in fact, even all women are sisters to all men. Chikka is in a boat crossing a river. It's the first time he has seen a river. It's the first time he's crossing a river. The first time he's in a snug boat made for four, going he doesn't know where with three strangers. Strangers who call him brother. So many firsts on a single day. Chika turns back just once. Where is the land he has left so suddenly, so easily? That bank, the village, the jungly no man's land dividing high and low, and beyond the pond, the untouchable settlement, his father's hut, his father. The horizon has swallowed it all up. Pedi, the ferryman, is deferential to elder brother, friendly with Putana, and indulgent to Chikka. Pedi shows off what he and the boat can do together. He slows down, comes to a stop, and the boat breathes on its own, moving where the river takes it. Suddenly, Pedi pulls back, then pushes and pulls like a demon, so the oars beat the water out of the way. The boat runs faster than the river. Pedi looks at Chika as if to say, see? Pedi could be his grandfather, giving him a treat. This is one more miracle in a day of miracles. It's late in the afternoon. The sun is well past mid-sky. It's slipping down the side of the sky. It spent the best or the worst of its strength. The sun is willing to be benign now. A breeze stirs. It turns cool, so cool. There's goose flesh on the river's skin. The water ripples. There's goose flesh on Chika's arm too. That thick skin made for humiliation or flogging or hopelessness is losing hold of him. It's peeling off him, falling to the floor of the boat like blood-streaked hide. This new chikka, the one who has just been born, hears a humming. It's Pedi. Putana and elder brother have heard him too. Elder brother leans across, taps Pedi on the shoulder. Sing, brother. Sing out loud. The river is waiting for you. This is all Pedi needs. He throws back his shoulders and sings as vigorously as he rows. His voice is strong, used to straddling the waves. My body is my boat, the boat my prayer. How it sings, this prayer, how it sings. Mid-river or safe on shore, body and boat, song and prayer, one and the same. Pedi sings the lines again. This time, Putana joins him. Their voices blend, so they become one. They're showing Chika what it is to have body, boat, song, and prayer become one and the same. So Chika learns what it is to live this word, this heady word called equality. But of course, as you know from our history, those movements are ruthlessly crushed. But before it is crushed, there is a great swell of resistance. 
again, if you replace the temple in the extract I'm going to read with a different institution, or in fact the streets, you will see that what happened possibly in the writer's imagination a thousand years back is still happening. It's midday in the rainless city. Everyone, whether in the palace, the temple, or the streets, is being boiled, baked, or roasted. The tension that has been building up with the anger, plans, and conspiracies, the stockpiling of arms, songs, lines of verse, pujas, a thousand traditions and a thousand challenges to them come to a head. The pressure has to escape soon, any minute, now. A motley group, but not so motley that they do not have a common purpose or common leaders, makes its way down the streets to the Grand Temple. It's a quiet and orderly procession with everyone walking four abreast, hands linked. Maybe it is this walking, marching image of unity made up of men and women of all sorts of trades and castes and names and histories which strikes awe and terror into those who peep out of windows from the biggest houses on the way. By the time the procession has reached the temple courtyard, all the windows and doors in the city houses are shut. Not far from the huge ornate doors of the Grand Temple, inside its front courtyard, where sandalwood is ground for the gods inside, where the big bell is rung to call the gods' attention, where clay and bronze and stone bull and peacock and lion and mouse and other divine vahanas lie like sentries waiting for the commands of god and priest, the crowd, or the people's army, all infantry, take their position in a semicircle facing the temple doors. The men in the first line begin to play their drums, flat pan-like drums, long gourd-like drums, every possible kind of drum as long as it has a good beat. Some go at their drums with sticks, others with their hands. Chikaya's hands feel empty. He's left his dream drum with Mahadevi. No matter, let it travel safe. Let it remember how it became his. Let it remember always the touch of his father who did not meet the word equal, or see the flowing river, or keep time to the beat of the Anandagrama songs. Then one by one, as if on signal, as if they have re rehearsed for months, the people around Chikaya begin to sing. One group sings, another group takes over, then hands over the lead to yet another. It's a never-ending wave, song following song, new voices rising when other voices subside. The refrains are year-splitting, evidence of unity. They sing the refrain together. When it's his turn to sing, Chikaya leads his brothers and sisters in singing about the river that brought him here. The fearsome four, his most beloved brothers, stand behind him, solid rocks, deep-rooted trees. Putana, Siddha, Chenna, Gundana. How the five of them bring together their distinct voices, how they make their tributaries flow into the same sea. There's one voice missing, though. Chikaya feels it keenly. Where's the woman's voice in his song? What is a song without Mahadevi? But then he hears Putana sing, this water is holy, and this, and this. Though his pitch is too low and he occasionally hits a false note, what scorn Putana can pour into each this. When stung, strung on that rough voice, the words come alive as if freshly made. This water is holy, and this, and this, they mumble in a foreign tongue, sprinkling a few drops on stony dolls in the temple, on the floors of their houses, and outside. These men even sprinkle water on themselves and say they are born again. My river, generous as always, gurgles as it laughs. Only those who have sweated day after day know what it is to be soaked, O oh friend. The last two lines rise to a crescendo, soak the air, bring Anandagrama to the temple, turn the temple surroundings into their Anandagrama. The lines say more than just the, their words. They say, listen to the sweaty wisdom of our work-filled lives.
hundreds of years later. We have a young man who is Dalit, but wants to be a doctor. Satya is a Kota student. And this is what the anatomy professor reminds him of. You know, I've often been told, you know, I grew up in a house where we really didn't think of caste. And I always then remember what my dear friend Bezwada Wilson said to me once, which is, I think that's wonderful. We should all reach a stage when all of us can say we don't need to think of caste at all. So unfortunately, there are far too many people reminded of their caste in word and deed every day. And of course, today, you can replace caste with community. There are more than, uh, there's more than one fault line in our country. Satya looks at the closed door with a forbidding nameplate. Dr. Professor Sharma, MBBS, MD. He takes a deep breath, knocks on the door, then pushes it open. Satya stands near the chair, waiting to be asked to sit down. Across the table, Dr. Sharma ignores him for several minutes. He's rereading Satya's latest test papers. It's a pile of them, so it can't be just the anatomy tests. How did he get hold of all his subject papers? Satya shifts from foot to foot. Then it strikes him. It must be Murti, the man in the office who has access to everything, from attendance sheets to test sheets. Dr. Sharma finally looks up. His face is blank, as if he has not summoned Satya there. Yes? Sir, Professor, you, you asked me to meet you. Dr. Sharma has lost his blank look. His face fills with mock puzzlement. Oh, yes, I remember now. There's something I don't understand, and I need you to explain it to me. Professor, what should I explain, sir? Your test marks in the other subjects. I know how badly you're doing in anatomy. Sharma's having a hard time keeping up the puzzle look. There's a smirk peeping through. Yes, Professor, I want to talk to you about the last test paper. I compared it with the answers in the text. Sharma ignores this. Instead, he says thoughtfully, how did your marks improve so suddenly in the other subjects? No one has noticed your copying? Satya is flabbergasted. Before he can say anything, Dr. Sharma leans forward, asks in a perfectly reasonable tone, all this trouble for what? Suppose you get your MBBS, just in case you do manage to get your degree from here, how many people would agree to be treated by you? His face hardens. His eyes bore holes in Satya's face. Sharma has stopped playing. He holds up his right hand, makes a fist of it. It's such a tight fist that whatever empty space remains inside must be airless. See this fist? Take a good look at it, because that's where your future is. And because all of us, writers, readers, men, women, children, citizens, must believe in the power of our hope, of dreams, and of resistance, I want to end with a little section from the last part of the book. The people ahead are moving. The rally has begun. The banners have been stretched out. The placards go up high enough to be seen and heard. And the slogans, how many there are, how they mingle words and languages. Then a long one voice call fills the air. The reply is many voiced. It's like a song Satya's mother and her friends may have once sung in the fields. The rally is moving slowly, but it's moving. People are crying themselves hoarse. They fill up the road. From where Asha walks, she can hear one wave shouting, Lal Salam. The wave that meets this one roars, Jai Bheem. Asha walks between the waves as if her thin, dark body, her voice can make a bridge. Every time she responds to a slogan, Asha feels her chest tighten. She means what she says. She means it so much 
she has to shout it out. The people's voice, Senthal called it. Senthal's voice, Ravi's voice, Ravi's drum that beats like a powerful heart. The voice Asha hears coming out of her mouth. Together, they may make up a song with many verses, with or without rhyme. And the refrain, it must boom its way into the air, into Ravi's airless home and Satya's mother's lost field and Asha's father's government office. It must roll like a tsunami, find its way into the classroom and court and parliament and Satya's grave. The refrain is the one part of the song that must be sung together. The sun shines so hard, it could be the most powerful slogan shouter in the crowd. The road ahead of them is as lustrous as water. The sweat pours down Asha's back. Her kurta is stuck to her skin. Ravi's face is wet, but he's hammering his drum, stopping only to wipe the sweat off his hands. Then an unexpected breeze arrives, turns into wind. It amplifies the people's slogans. The wind blows, teaching everything, every scrap of junk, every person there what it is, to move, to refuse to stay in the same old tight-fitting place. The slogans get louder and the drums beat harder. In this blur of faces, words, and voices, Asha can almost be believe that this crowd is not alone. There are other crowds in places across the country. There are strong currents flowing down roads and fields through villages and towns and cities. The crowd mills around Asha and Ravi. Ravi's drum has finally gone silent. She takes Ravi's hand. The red and blue flags, the words, the voices, the people. Is it only today? Or has this river of living bodies been flowing for a thousand years? The river rises. It fills Asha with anger and grief, but also a strange joy. She can hear Satya tell her, or maybe it's she who's telling Satya and Ravi, even Professor Krishna and Chikaya. I have become the tide. Thank you. So, yes. yes. Uh, we are now opening, uh, you know, it would be wrong for me to ask any more questions now. We are opening this now to questions from the audience. We have just about 10 minutes just under 10 minutes. So please keep your questions short and identify yourselves, please. Ma'am, uh, you spoke of dissent. So uh, there's this famous quote by Voltaire, like I'm paraphrasing it, that I might not agree with what you say, but I will defend my, uh, uh, till my death, you're right to say it. So there are students like me, there are women, there are other sections of society who are on the streets right now. and. Uh, you know, forget about the leaders are not even listening to us. So do you think dissent, in the whole ambit of dissent, there also comes a part of listening to the other party? Because are we as a society forgetting to listen to the other side? And we are simply shutting them out. We are using force to block out the dissenting voices. So do you think we are, you know, regressing as a society when it comes to listening to other people? Like, you know, I can just hit you on the head with an iron rod, but does it solve the problem? Like, are you addressing that? So, that is Well, it's not we um, who are not listening. Um, uh, as you said, the leaders, and I'd put the, the, that word in very, very, very fat quotation marks. Um, just as we are now saying the alleged yogi, we are also saying the alleged leaders. Um, so they're not leaders. Um, if they don't listen to people, if they don't speak, uh, in words that make sense uh, to the people who made them leaders, they don't deserve to be there. And uh, what we're seeing today is um, is actually, it's, it's not that they're not listening. It's actually brazenness. It's to say, we are going to be here till you push us out. So that's our job, to push them out. Good evening, ma'am. So my question is, um, throughout history, Buddha, Guru Nanak, they had something going for them. Whatever they were saying was quite novel. 
there were no other voices. But today what we see is that the authoritarian people who are in power currently, whatever they say, it holds a, a bit of appeal to the masses. Whereas what we are saying today in our intellectual circles, it's kind of hollow because whatever we say it does not penetrate to say the rickshaw puller. Because what I'm talking about, it's very difficult for him to understand. So how do we like solve this problem? How do we, we can't shout. So how do we get through to their hearts? Thank you. Well, you've asked the right person because I'm not an expert on anything. Um, so uh, I think to be a writer, you have to be humble every day. You truly uh, live a life of humility uh, because you don't know anything. What you do know is to ask questions. And I think that is something that we can, um, we can teach other people, which is don't be so sure you have the answers, but ask questions. Um, uh, each of us is gifted with a different level of intelligence, but we're all intelligent. So to worry about the divide, will somebody else understand? You've already created a, a, a distance, and why? God knows we already live in a part of the world where we're born with distances. Uh, you know, uh, drummed into our heads. So I think if you are willing to learn and listen, and any good teacher here in the audience will tell you that teachers learn as much from their students as students learn from their teachers. So similarly, if, if I go to Park Circus today, I'm going to learn not just about their courage and their strength in sitting there night after night, but I'm actually going to learn about how to live a difficult life because, of course, class and caste do uh, cushion you uh, from seeing some of the difficulties of life close up. So what we have to imagine, a lot of people live. So I don't think it's a question of you know, uh, all of life is a, is a process of learning to talk to somebody else and learning to understand somebody else, because that's the only way we're going to understand who you are. So that's true at home and on the streets. Uh, thank you. We'll take just one more question. That's the last question. Thank you. Hello. This is not a question exactly, rather a remark. I belong to the generation, the post-Beatles generation, the 70s. And we had our dreams and aspirations. Now I have my daughters in the streets, protesting, dissenting. It is gladdening. Now, hearing you, I feel there's something electric in the air. There's something that's going to give. It gives a lot of hope. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. I must say, please tell your daughters that you met an old woman who was also on the streets when she was young. <laughs> uh, Thank you so much. I think that was a wonderful note on which to end this session, exactly on time, 6.20. Uh, and I'd like to uh, emphasize again uh, that Gita's novel, uh, though it was written before these, this wave of mass protest, which is now going on, it was written before, but nevertheless, it is so deeply resonant. It speaks to uh, that electric atmosphere that we uh, live in today. It speaks to these voices of dissent. It speaks to the sense that the people's voice can be heard, that it can become a tide that will um, overthrow forces of opposition. So uh, let's hope for that. Let's hope that we can make and it may happen. I, may Thank I you. have one last word? Novels apart, books are fine, but real life is what is most important. So I think we should all say, we'll go forth tomorrow, Sunday, there's tonight, and we should all go where the people, where our sisters are protesting. Thank you.